I'm Elliot Harold. I'm going to talk to you today about some practical problems that I've encountered at Google um, in resolving diamond dependency conflicts in Java. Um, I remember when I was first learning Java and when would that have been, 24, 25 years ago, something like that. Um, one of the things that was advertised was that unlike C++, Java inheritance hierarchies didn't have diamond dependency problems. And Java didn't have pointers, and Java didn't have memory leaks, and how many of those things proved to be true? So um, lately, I've been spending a lot of time worrying about diamond dependency issues across libraries. In my case, specifically the libraries that the Google Cloud Platform publishes is open source for the use of various you know, customers who are deploying their apps to things like Google Cloud Storage, App Engine, Spanner, that sort of thing. I'm not going to go into any details about the specific products, but they're out there. A lot of the stuff I'm talking about is all on GitHub. It's easily accessible. Um, some of the things I'm going to talk about are 1% type problems, by which I mean, you know, these are the edge conditions. 99% of the time, nothing like this happens until things get complicated and then it happens all the time. And things always get complicated. So that's where we're going. Now, um, There we go, okay. So before we begin, usual disclaimer. I mean, th this is my personal opinion. Um, this is not official policy. Google these days is too big to have official policies about most things. So um, take it for what it's worth. It's a small group, so feel free to ask questions during the session. I may say we'll get to that or I may ask if it's a very specific question, to hold it out into the hallway later, but also we can discuss as we go along. Now, who am I? I'm currently tech lead of Google Cloud Tools for Eclipse, and I'm also a big part of Google's Diamond Dependency Project for Java libraries. I've written a few libraries myself um, prior to Google, including Zom. Um, I'm the current maintainer for the Jackson Library for XML um, sorry, for XPath processing. I have made some minor contributions to the Maven project over the last few years. So I'm going to be talking a lot about Maven and also about Gradle. And I've written a few books. How many of you, are, I should ask, are using Maven today? How many of you are using Gradle? You're allowed to put your hand up more than once. How many of you are using Ant? How many, oh good, we've got some ant people. Um, how many of you are using Bazel or Blaze? Okay, that, that, that one not so commonly. One thing that unifies, any, anything else people are using is the build system, Buck or something, yeah. Just use NetBeans, okay. Um, there's always one. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, where was I going with this? Yes, yeah, I, I just got too distracted by net beans. It's been a while. So whichever build tool you're using in Java in 2019, chances are you're still using the Maven central repository system. Whether, even if you're not using Maven, if you're using Gradle, you're probably pulling down artifacts from the Maven repo system and you're assembling them into your class paths according to a particular algorithm. The algorithms are not the same if you're using Maven or if you're using Gradle, but they are very similar. The only other thing you're likely to be using is the Eclipse P2 OSGI infrastructure. And even in that case, you're often ver very often sitting on top of Maven Central as well. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, besides myself, um, credit where credit is due, a lot of the work I'm talking about today was done by these two engineers at Google. 
Um, some of the slides were written by them as well. Garrett Jones in Seattle and Tomo Suzuki, who was here at Code One until about two hours ago, and then he had to fly back to New York. Um, he talked about some of the things, some of this stuff on Monday evening. I, anybody he, was anybody here for the lightning talks on Monday evening? If not, it's going to be completely new to you. Cool. Who are you? Who am I? Th this is important. I'm assuming that you're all Java developers. I'm assuming that you are reasonably experienced Java developers and that you have used some sort of build system. I'm going to assume that you understand what the class path is and how it works and have at least some experience with class loaders. Hope, how, how many of you in this audience have ever encountered the case where you've had the same class loaded by more than one class loader? Okay, so you, know, you, you felt the pain. You remember that happening. If, if you've done that at some point in time, you're more than ready for this talk. How many of you are familiar with module paths, which is a new thing in Java 9 and later? This is a current thing that is causing me great pain and that I'm trying to help resolve across a number of Google libraries because a lot of them are incompatible with the Java module system, which is becoming more of an issue as time passes. Um, okay, so I asked for a show of hands. And I assume everyone here has at some point or another use the Maven repository system. Maybe you went to search.maven.org, maybe you just download it as part of your build process. Either way, you know that there is a big repo that's mirrored by Cloudflare across many different places, that has lots and lots of jar files in it, that the jar files are all signed, that the jars all have pom.xml files that say that this jar depends on these eight other artifacts. And those artifacts have their own pom.xml files that say which artifacts they depend on. And so on until you have a rather deep tree and your class path contains several hundred jars in it that are put into a particular order. That is true even if the particular jar is created by Gradle or Ant or something that is not Maven. The pom.xml file actually serves two different purposes in the Java world today. Only one is describing how to build a project. The other is describing the dependencies trees for individual jar archives, and that's the part that concerns us today. I'm gonna to assume this whether you have worked with um, whatever the different build systems are. And now let's delve into the nature of a diamond dependency conflict in Java. How does it arise? What is it? Why is it painful? Some of you have probably already seen this. Now, if we take a very simple example here, we figure we have a library A, version one. Or this could just be an end user product, doesn't have to be a library specifically. But there is some jar A, version one, which depends on some other library B, also in this example at version one. And B depends on D version one. You know, of course, they could be version 1.3.8, doesn't really matter, we'll just keep things simple for the moment. Very simple class path. And generally, when Maven or Gradle puts this together into an actual class path, the linear sequence is gonna be A, then B, then D. And each class will be in one and only one of those jars. There should not be any classes in more than one of those jars, if we're lucky. Now what happens, D releases a new version, D version two. And then there's a new library somewhere else, library C, which depends on version D2. Okay, we're all still happy, no problems. But now we release A version two. And A version two, you know, adds some new features for which it adds C version one. A version two depends on C version one. C version one, remember, depends on D version two. But A version two still also depends on B version one. And which version of D does B depend on? Depends on D version one. Now we actually have a tree that has two different versions of the same library. And whatever build tool you're using, Maven or Gradle or some Bazel or something else, has to pick one of them. This will vary sometimes if Maven 
given this tree would actually pick D version one, which means things break because B, C presumably needs D version two, not D version one. Gradle would actually pick D version two. This is one of the tricky bits. Gradle and Maven do not use the same dependency mediation algorithm. Given a conflict, given multiple versions of a particular library, Maven and Gradle do not always choose the same one. Gradle chooses the most recently released one as indicated by the version numbers. Maven, by contrast, chooses the library that is closest to the top of the tree in a depth first, left to right order. So they can end up with different libraries. This though is the problem. And the more incompatible D version one and D version two are, the worse it is. Now in a lot of cases, D version two has everything D version one has and it hasn't changed anything incompatibly, just added some new things. So if we can figure out a way to force the system to pick up D version two, it will all work. In less copacetic scenarios, D version one and D version two are not fully compatible and there are errors in either direction, which is troublesome. So this is where we get into trouble. Now, the real solution here, A has to make a, has to force B to release a new version that depends on D2, and then A can depend on B version two instead. This is hard when one company owns all the pieces. In the world I live in, that company is often Google. And I, it's still painful to herd all the cats, to get you know, all the different teams that produce these individual libraries to release compatible versions. When multiple companies and independent software developers, you know, this library comes from Oracle, that comes from Google, this one comes from Amazon, this one comes from Franz Josef over in Denmark somewhere, it's very hard to get these all to get put together at the same time. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about is how do you herd the cats and how can we do a better job of herding the cats. And that was the simple example. That was the toy example. In the real world, this is what your dependency graph looks like. I don't even have all of it in here. This is the dependency graph for I think Google Cloud Vision API client library and all of its dependencies and all of their dependencies and all of their dependencies and so on. Over in the upper left hand corner there, I think if I recall, that's the Google HTTP Java client which sits on top of the Apache HTTP components. Somewhere in the middle there, there's a big block of stuff around the Google API common library. It's a mess. So, the, and there are conflicts between different versions of things throughout all of this. So this is what we're trying to resolve. I, I, I will tell you one not quite secret. The way we do this inside Google, not in the open source stuff, is we actually have very strict policies that across the entire company, we're never using more than one version of any library. If we're using Jackson 1.2.3, every project at Google is using Jackson 1.2.3. There's no project that depends on Jackson 1.2.4 or 1.1 or 0.7.5. There is exactly one version of Jackson in our source repository. And same thing for every other third party library we use. And we build everything from head at head all the time. In the open source world, this doesn't work. That works inside Google because we have a monolithic repository for everything. Outside of Google, when you're on GitHub and when you're trying to get multiple companies and independent developers and teams to work together, forget about it. You can't do that. At least I've never seen it done. So what do you do instead? Now that was just one Java library. Now let's add an Apache library. In, in particular, let's think about Beam. Beam has a lot of dependencies and it's really hard to make them all work together. It includes all the dependencies you saw on the previous slide that looked like a galaxy or something and a lot more, you know, several times more. Um, you can sort of fix it and you can sort of make it work until you need to upgrade one of the dependencies and then things start breaking again. Or you need to take a project that's going to mix Beam with Spring Cloud. 
who here is using Spring or Spring Cloud? You know, a few hands, not as many hands as I would have expected, but okay. Um, because Spring brings in a whole different batch of dependencies, some of which overlap with the dependencies Beam has, some of which don't, but all the transitive dependencies pull in still many more versions and many, many more opportunities for conflict. The possible combinations grow, to be mathematically precise, combinatorically, and um, soon even things that happen one time in 100, you've got multiple examples of it. So this is actually a real bug we had that we solved with some of our tools where we couldn't get a spring application up and running. Jackson's another case. I mentioned earlier that I work on this project. And in the case of Jackson, then there is, there are cycles in the dependency tree. This is just ugly. Um, this isn't supposed to happen, but it does. The reason it happens is because Jackson goes all the way back to Maven 1.0, and a lot, of the a lot of the rules for how you do things with Maven weren't set in stone yet, and at the same time, you know, even when there were rules, we didn't know what the rules were. So a lot of mistakes were made, and some of those mistakes are still with us today, and I'm trying to untangle some of these things as time permits, but the problem is it's really hard to correct the old mistakes without breaking old backwards compatibility. So some of these things we're sort of stuck with. It gets worse if you're using Java 9 or later. Who here is using Java 9 or later? Okay, about half of you. It is hard enough to do, get all this together in Java 8. In Java 9, something else was added, the Java platform module system which is supposed to fix some of these problems, but in fact just adds a whole bunch of other rules you can break. And in particular, you have to worry about split packages where you have not just two classes in different jars, but you, have, you can't have the same package or same sub packages in different jars if you're using the platform module system. If you do that, if that happens, then you will get a compile time error. And you don't actually have to do it yourself. All you have to do is just import any two jars from anywhere in the world, anywhere in your transitive dependency tree that probably includes hundreds of packages from many different companies that happen to have split the packages. So for example, gRPC, Google Cloud Java, um, roughly all Google client API libraries, these all do it. So it's really hard to use those in Java 9 or later. I'm working on fixing that. We're not there yet. Um, so yeah, things that don't work. <laughs> this, is, this really is the problem, that we've got these different modules that create classes in the same packages. Now, what other problems are we dealing with? We've got linkage errors where in a jar, you methods are being called that are not actually in the transitive dependency graph. That's really problematic. We have upper bounds errors. These aren't necessarily diamond dependency conflicts, but they're also problems where, okay, a version of a library is selected, but it's not the most recent version. Um, this happens to us a lot. These are some examples where it's happening. We have conflicting submodules. Um, open census has been a particular pain point for us because it's changing very rapidly. It's a new technology and we're integrating into gRPC and a lot of other things. But every time they release a new version, about every other week, um, half the ecosystem updates and half doesn't and there are conflicts between the different versions. You know, this, this is the case that happens. And also, of course, out of date dependencies. That's a really painful one. We have beta versions, we have duplicate libraries, we have I don't know how many different libraries are parsing JSON. This is all painful. This is the world we're living in. So I'm now going to talk about in the second half is some best practices and some rules and some principles that we've published for avoiding these problems in the first place and getting us to a world where these problems don't happen. These are mostly for people who are publishing libraries. I'm also going to talk about tooling for avoiding these problems when you have to. Now, the details on a lot of things I'm talking about are that URL, jlbp.dev. 
You can see the official documentation that we have published. We've actually, at this point in time, written 20 different rules for Java libraries developers. Um, I only could fit 19 on the slide. I think number 20 is to have an automatic module name. I'm going to talk about a few of them here. If you want to read up on the rest or ask me about them in the hallway, feel free. But these are, I think, some of the most important things you can do as a li anyone who's publishing a library, anyone who's publishing a jar that you expect anybody else to use, that you expect anybody else to invoke your code in. These are useful things to do. The most important thing you can do by far is minimize your own dependencies. This is critical. In fact, this applies even if you're not creating a library of your own. Do not pull in dependencies without a very good reason. Do not pull them in just because it saves you a little bit of time coding. Every dependency you can include, every extra library you depend on, is a liability and exposes you to risk. The more dependencies you have, the greater the risk of something surprising going wrong. Um, dependencies have bugs in them. They can have security issues. This is one of my favorites, Apache Commons Collections 3.2.1, very popular library. Who uses Commons Collections from Apache? Yeah. Um, in version 3.2.1, it had a CVSS 10.0 vulnerability. This is the most serious kind of vulnerability that exists. Simply because this was on the class path of the application, it didn't have to be called. You didn't have to actually invoke it. It just had to be on your class path somewhere. This library causes the Java serialization parser for the entire JVM process to go from being a state machine to a Turing machine, a Turing machine with an exec function. Put this on the class path and you have just been owned by every cracker on the internet. That's all you had to do. You didn't even have to call a method in this library. These sorts of problems are rare. They're a little rarer in Java than they are in some other systems. I've seen them come up in Ruby systems as well. But every library you put has risks. So I tend to avoid libraries unless they're really, really useful. If they save me lots of time, great. If they save a little time, I'll write the code myself. Another risk you get with adding extra libraries is that sometimes one library will work until you add a second, and then they fail because of diamond dependency conflicts. So again, the most important thing you can do, get rid of dependencies wherever you can. De adding dependencies using libraries prioritizes writability and speed of how fast you can get code out over how well you can maintain the code. Generally, I prefer to focus on the maintenance of the code as opposed to the maintainability, as opposed to how fast I can ship the code. Um, they pri one way of saying is they prioritize launches over landings. Now, if you can easily write something yourself, please do so. For example, who uses Guava? See a few more hands going up. Um, if the only classes you use from Guava are simple ones, like preconditions, dot check not null, maybe strings dot two uppercase, that sort of thing, I wouldn't choose Guava. It's too much of a risk. There are a lot of conflicts that come about because the, you've got the current nice version of Guava and some other library you depends on is using Guava JDK 5 15.0 from 2011. And they're not compatible. So when you pull that in, you have excessive risk. Now, if you're using more complicated things from Guava, sure, but I would be careful about that. If possible, if you have an option in the JDK and you have an option that's not in the JDK, java.time versus jodatime, for example, use the one that's in the JDK, please, even if the one that's not in the JDK is a lot simpler and a lot easier to use. Um, Java.util.logging is a very common one. I would say far too few people use this, far too many people use things like Apache logging, um, SLF for J, et cetera. For no particular good reason, they're not doing anything that requires it. So there's, I don't know why developers so love to write logging frameworks, but they do. There are too many of them out there. 
if a lot something does justify extra functionality, I don't recommend you write your own JSON parser, for example, your own XML parser. Now there is an XML parser in the JDK, you can use that one. There is no JSON parser in the JDK. So for there, yes, use a well-tested, well-supported, well-understood library, by all means. Use one. Do not use two or three. Most of the Google Cloud Java code, I regret to inform you, does depend on at least three different JSON parsers. And what's going on is it's a big project, it's been done by many developers, many teams over many years now, and at certain, some point in time, one developer said, I like to use javax.json, and some other developer said, I like to use json, and some other developer said, I like to use this other library over here. And you put it all together, and it's a mess. And it may work, but it's extra risk. I would try and standardize on a single library for any one purpose, you know, as a rule. And then when you add your libraries, use the smallest scope possible. In particular, if you have a library that's only for testing, Makito, assert for j JUnit, please make sure you specify them as test only in your build system. These are, that's especially important because a lot of these are doing really weird hacky stuff behind the scenes with um, reflection and class load, dynamic class loading, all sorts of strange things, the mocking libraries in particular. You don't want that stuff on your runtime class path. It's a huge security risk rating to happen. It's fine for testing, really great. Just don't get it into your runtime and you'll be good. Okay, that's pr best practice number one. Best practice number two, and this one is for library vendors, minimize your API surface. If you are using third-party libraries, you can use a third-party JSON parser, for example, but don't make your own method return types types from that library, because once you've done that, you've tightly coupled your API to your implementation, and you can't really change your own API, you can't switch to a different JSON parser or a new incompatible JSON parser without also breaking your clients. So if you're going to use third-party libraries, just keep them out of your own API surface. Most of the time, your own API should be composed of JDK types, you know, things like string, big decimal, integer, et cetera, and types from your own library, nothing else, okay? That's practice number two. Practice number three, semantic versioning. Who here is familiar with semantic versioning? Most of you. In brief, it says, you know, major version, minor version, patch. More importantly, it says, when you increment the major version, things are no longer compatible. 2.x may not be fully incompatible with 1.x. If you increment the minor version, there can be new features, but we haven't taken anything away, we haven't broken anything. And if you increment the patch, the API should be exactly the same. So keep this in mind for your own versions. Try and follow it so that people have information that they need to understand if upgrading to a new version of your library is likely to break them. And for whenever you're consuming a library, be very, very cautious before accepting a dependency on a pre-1.0 library. That is a huge problem. I see people do it all the time, inside and outside of Google. That people say, well, I think this is a good library, it's gonna save me a lot of time, and it's 0.1.6. That's great until they release 0.1.7 and everything has changed. And then some other library you depend on depends on 0.1.8 and it's diamond dependency issues occur. Try and limit yourself to 1.0 or later libraries. If there is an unstable library, an unstable feature, avoid it, don't use it, please make life easy for yourself. Um, the case that has really hit me personally lately, I don't know if anyone here is using Open Census yet, it's a new system for distributed tracing that we're working on, but it's evolving very quickly. It's really hot. There's a lot of interest in the product. Every team wants to use it, but since it's evolving so fast, every new version is incompatible with the previous version. And it's very easy for 
library A to have open census 0.18, library B to have open census 0.19, and library C to have open census 0.24. And then you can't put A, B, and C together without breaking because all these pre-1.0 versions have different APIs. So you want to stay away from products that, have, that are evolving very quickly until some sort of commitment has been made to stability. That's important. Now, the converse of that is that if you are shipping your own library, please get 1.0 out the door as quickly as possible, even if it's not perfect, and especially even if it's incomplete. Once you are reasonably confident that your API is stable and that you do not have to change it, ship a 1.0. You can ship a 2.0 later if you have to change it, but it's better to commit to something sooner and earlier then wait forever for it to be perfect. I have seen far too many libraries that sit out in beta or 0.4, 0.5 for years, often until the original product team has moved on and gone away and nobody's even maintaining it anymore. I can point to so many examples of that. Finish what you start, please. Or say this isn't going to work and we're deprecating and getting rid of it, one or the other but try to commit to the functionality. Okay, I'm gonna skip over a few less important ones. As a consumer of these libraries, please try to stay up to date with compatible dependencies. Try to upgrade within a reasonable time frame. Say six weeks of a new version of Guava coming out, try to be on the new version of Guava. Try to be on the new version of whatever. Sometimes it's critical because in a lot of the libraries I deal with, the back-end systems are changing, and if you don't upgrade, you're no longer going to be able to talk to our back-end systems. Sometimes it's not so critical. But if you just stick around with Guava 15 that you added to the product in 2013, because it does everything you need it to do and you don't want to take the risk of the upgrade, that means anybody who's depending on you is pulling Guava 15, they may be using Guava 28. Guess what, those versions are not compatible. So um, the closer you are to head, generally the easier you are going to make life for your own clients and your own consumers. That's important. Let's look at Guava. The current version, I think, unless they released a new one this week while I've been in San Francisco, is 28.1, okay? Um, they've been releasing one every couple of months. Um, I think 25 was when they first, you know, said we're going to have versions for Java 7 and Java 8. 20 was the last version that was for Java 7 and not for Java 8. I mean, it works with Java 8, but they didn't have any Java 8 specific features. 19 was fairly common before that, and there's still some versions of 15 out there. Which of these do you think is the major is the oldest version common used today. Who says 28.1? Anyone want to bet on 27? 25? Okay, 25. 23? Okay, one hand going up. 20? 20 is a popular one. 19? 15? Okay, you can get a few more hands up. It's 12. And I think that's from like 2010 or something. It's, you know, that still shows up. And again, the reason it shows up is not because people are using it directly, but because they're pulling it in through transitive dependencies, including transitive dependencies of very old things that are just horribly out of date. Yes? We'll get to some tooling that can show you that. Um, but yeah, you sort of have to print out the entire transitive dependency graph of your project and look at it to see which versions are coming in from where and which ones are getting selected, and it, it's a bit of a mess. Okay, the older your dependencies are, the more likely you are to experience linkage conflicts and linkage errors. Even if you're not upgrading other things, other people who are pulling you in will see that. So be careful. Similarly, Deprecation. If you are relying on a deprecated feature in a library, please get rid of it quickly. Um, I encountered this recently in gRPC. 
where they were about half a lifetime off of head in an authentication library. That's pretty critical because they didn't want to change the usage of a couple of deprecated methods they were using in tests. Um, it can be painful to replace deprecated methods with the, you know, whatever is supposed to replace them, but try to do that within a reasonable amount of time. Please don't turn off your deprecation warnings. I'm going to skip over that. How many of you have used shading? Okay. Shading is a last resort. It's where you pull in a library like, you know, Jackson, org.jackson, and you replace everywhere it says org.jackson with com foo.bar.org.jackson so that you've effectively got a complete copy of the library in different packages. It's painful, it bloats things, it can work, but it's going to require some manual tweaking in a lot of cases. And the worst problem is once you've shaded a library to pull it in to avoid dependency conflicts, you are often then stuck with old bugs and old security fixes, unless you reshade and repull in the new library, which nobody ever does, in my experience. So shading only if absolutely necessary. Okay, um, now, this will help answer your question somewhat. Tools, those are some best practices for how to avoid getting into these problems. What can you do when you're already in them? The other thing my team has been working on besides publishing these best practice documents is creating a number of tools that will help you work with this and diagnose the problems when they occur so you can fix them. The first tool is the Maven Enforcer rule. This is currently, I think, version 1.0.0. We got 1.0 out the door. I pushed very hard to declare it 1.0. Um, and here's an example of running it where we have added the Enforcer rule. We run it on a project. This, you know, imagine there's a directory of source code. It contains a pom.xml and all the usual Java source code. It's building the App Engine Plugins core library, which is open source on GitHub. And it's found some errors. In particular, it's found that certain jars in the dependency graph are calling certain methods or have references to certain methods and classes that aren't anywhere in the class path. This is called a linkage error. It can be more or less serious in practice depending on the nature of the error. In this case, um, you know, sometimes these are false positives. Surprisingly often they are true positives. In this case, you can see that we have commons compress 1.18.jar in our class path, and it's looking for these weird classes named things like org.tukani.xz.lzma2options and it's not finding them. It's referenced by some other classes in the jar. Now, is that a problem? It depends on whether your code is going to execute those co code paths or not. S usually, it's not executing them frequently, because if it was, you would have already seen the error in production. But if it's an obscure code path, if it's something, in this case, maybe it only comes about when somebody sends you a file that is in some sort of weird encoding not a lot of people use, but if somebody uploads that, then your system breaks. Maybe it's a denial of service attack. So it's worth digging into these problems when they occur and understanding them. Now, how do you actually make this work? It's pretty straight. Okay, here's an example of a project that does have dependency conflicts, a pom.xml. You run the compile. And I can't really read that I'm, myself. I'm sorry, the font is too small. Um, and it will report, you know, and it compiles just fine. This is without the enforcer rule. You run that program, you get a no such method error. How did that happen? How did it compile with the no such method error? Because the no such method error came from the transitive dependencies, from the jar files you weren't actually compiling. If you add the Maven enforcer rule, though, into your project, into your pom.xml, as part of the build as shown here as one of the executions, then what will happen is when you attempt to build the project, you will get a compile time error. The enforcer rule is taking those linkage errors and it's moving them from runtime 
into compile time, where you find them sooner, and the sooner you find a bug like this, the easier it is to fix. Now, this is not something that's going to find bugs every time you run it. Like a lot of static analysis tools, this will find more the first time you run it than the tenth time you run it. Because you run it, you find the problems, you fix them, and then you run it again. Okay, maybe you find a couple more, you fix them, you run it again, there are none. If you add this to your build, though, it will keep you from introducing new linkage errors into your build, which can happen anytime you update a dependency. Or a dependency updates their own transitive versions. One thing, by the way, it's really nasty, I didn't talk about this yet. You would think that if you don't actually change your code, you don't change any dependency versions, you don't change what you depend on, you can't actually you know, have a product working on Tuesday and breaking on Wednesday. It's not actually true. I've seen it happen. And what happens is if one of your dependencies is using a version range, it may mean that today, on Tuesday, you are depending on App Engine GCS client 0.3, and tomorrow, without changing any of your code at all, you are suddenly depending on App Engine GCS client 0.5. I've seen it happen. And that can, so don't use version ranges. I think there's a best practice on that. The second thing you can do to fix your own issues in a project is use bills of materials. This is essentially a Maven Palm that you import that defines particular versions of individual libraries. In this case, the com.google.cloud libraries bomb lists compatible versions of a lot of the Google Cloud Platform libraries that we publish. Use them all together, these versions, no others, and you will avoid a lot of problems because you know, we verified that these versions are compatible with each other. There are other bombs for other projects. Spring publishes one, Beam is working on one, et cetera. And then in your own pom.xml, don't specify the version. Instead, you import the bomb and let the bomb pick the versions of all the products to use. This doesn't totally cure all your diamond dependency conflict problems, but it gets rid of a lot of the subtle incompatibilities. And then the third and final tool we've built, this is, goes most closely to answering your earlier question. Currently, this is just something we run for our own libraries, although it is all open source code, and you can download it from GitHub and set it up for your own if you care to, is we've set up a linkage monitor that looks at the versions of the various libraries in the bomb, periodically runs through them, and looks for specific linkage errors and other problems that may occur, like upper bounds errors, and reports them. So you see currently of 200-something artifacts at the time this slide was put together. We have relatively few linkage errors, but we have some. We don't have many upper bounds, local upper bounds errors. We have lots of global upper bounds errors and dependency convergence. Forget about it, it's hopeless. It would be nice to have, but we don't see any path forward short of moving to a complete mono repo that would do it. Okay, I think we're just about out of time, so if there are any final questions before they kick us out, other thoughts? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, you, you can see there for, sure, you can see how many people are using this library, how many other projects are using it. That can be useful information. Yes. Okay, so two questions. First is the build time overhead for the linkage checker enforcer rule. It's negligible. It's reasonably fast on modern hardware. We haven't, we, the, some of our early versions were actually quite slow. We made a number of optimizations and we don't notice any problems with that these days. Um, there might be some more optimizations we could do if it was noticeably adding a, a certain amount of wall clock time. The second question is, has anyone yet done this for Gradle as opposed to Maven? Um, not to my knowledge. We have not. I have not seen anything, but I'm not a big Gradle expert. Gradle, in my experience, has slightly fewer problems than Maven-based build systems, and that's primarily a result of the dependency mediation algorithm 
because Gradle always picks the most recent version and Maven has this weird graph search algorithm for which version it picks and it may often will not pick the most recent version in the tree. So with Gradle, you don't worry about things like upper bounds. You will get upper bounds satisfied. That said, that is not a full solution. It just means you have fewer problems, not none. Okay, I think they're saying time's up. Um, so thank you very much for coming. I hope you have fewer diamond dependency problems now. I'll be happy to chat with anybody who wants to delve into this in more detail. Thank you.